And as you're getting seated, if you could open in your Bible to Judges chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 through 5 this morning. Judges chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning. If you could switch me to this mic, this one's falling off for me. Um, and as you're flipping over to the book of Judges, I want us to open by considering the question this morning, how should we respond when our sin is exposed? How should we respond when our sin is brought to the light, exposed to other people, and more importantly, how should we respond when our sin is brought before the Lord and before his judgment? Now, as we get to chapter 2 of the book of Judges, uh, Judges chapter 1 was full of faith and conquest and faithlessness and defeat. The book of Judges begins in the first half of chapter 1 with God's people going forward into the promised land, taking on the enemies that God had called them to conquer, full of faith that God was with them, that he was their strength, that through him they would see the victory. And they went forward and did that very thing for the first half of the chapter. But then as we looked at last week, the people began to doubt God's promises. They began to be cowardly. They began to result to half measures. And the result of this was failure of the people. And we saw throughout God's providence that the people failed over and over again. But as we get to chapter two, we will see how does God then respond to this failure of the people? What is he going to say to this people who have compromised and compromised and compromised and thus failed to do what he had called them to do? And as we will see, as their sin is exposed, as it's brought before God's judgment, it will turn into a house of weeping, which is the title of this morning's sermon. Not a very uplifting sermon title, but that's the text we have in front of us, a house of weeping. So as you look at your Bibles, please read with me God's word that he has for us from Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bacham, and they sacrificed their to the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? O oh, great God of heaven and judge over all the earth, we come before you today as people who are sinners, as people who are unclean, as those who have transgressed your law. And we know as the great judge that we will have to answer to you for our sins, just as these people are now hearing your judgment in light of their sins. God, I pray that as we consider this text this morning, we would consider the power of who you are as a judge. We would consider the greatness of your covenant faithfulness and mercy despite our sin. And also, Lord, that we would be keenly aware of the danger and the reality of a false repentance of an outward show that is not reflection of an inward reality, of going through the motions before you that does not produce anything that's genuine or sustaining. Lord, I pray that all of us would be willing to have that honest conversation with ourselves if we're going through the motions before the Lord. Or is our repentance when we offer it genuine? Lord, would you help us consider these things? Would you do it by your spirit? 
Would you show us Christ in this text? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, as we are working through this section this morning, this really brings us to the end of Judges' first introduction. You might have remembered I said in the first sermon that Judges is a particularly interesting book in the way it's structured, in that it has two introductions and two conclusions. And this morning we get to the end of introduction number one. As we've been going through this, we saw conquest in the first section. We saw compromise in the second section. And now we see the Lord's response at the end of this first introduction. Then next week, Lord willing, we'll get into the second introduction. If you notice how verse six begins, it says, when Joshua dismissed the people, But if you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, what does it say? After the death of Joshua, right? So it goes back to this man who had already said it deceased because it's giving a second introduction. And we're going to see both of those things answered in the two conclusions at the end of the book. It's the way that this one was structured. It's different than how we typically write, but God is a better author than we are. And he's doing this for a very specific purpose. But as we're working through this this morning, we're really going to just have two points. If you look at your bulletin, there's going to be some sub points under that. But really, there's just two main points we see in God's response to the people. And that is God speaking and the people weeping. God speaking and the people weeping. As we begin, let's begin by considering what God has to say to these people, how God speaks in the first three verses of this text. And it opens with us seeing that God's voice going forward. And we must realize that when God speaks, it is a powerful reality. Things happen when the voice of the Lord comes forward. If you go back to the beginning of our Bible, how is it that the cosmos and the heaven and the earth came into being? They came into being because God spoke them into being. His voice is powerful. Everything you've ever seen or touched or smelled exists because God spoke it into being. His voice is powerful. As Christians, as those who are the people of faith, those of us who have been redeemed, the reason why you have faith in Christ, the reason why you're sitting in this room is because God has spoken. What does it say in Romans 10, 17, that so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ or the speaking, the proclamation of Christ. It is God's voice that is giving you faith in him this morning. But when God speaks, it is not only powerful in a cosmic sort of way, although it is that. It's not only powerful in a spiritual way, although it is that. It's also powerful in an absolutely terrifying way when the voice of the Lord comes before humanity. What does it say in Psalm 29, 3 through 9? It says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory or the God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, snaps them. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. We must realize that when God speaks is a terrifying reality. It's a glorious reality and a majestic reality. But this voice of the Lord can snap the largest trees in the forest. This voice of the Lord can strip them bare. It can cause the craziest storm at sea to seem calm compared to its fury. It's a terrifying thing often when God speaks. We must see as God is now speaking that as he speaks, the voice of the Lord must be obeyed. Deuteronomy and Moses um, is giving basically his eulogy. The book of Deuteronomy is often mistaken as just some boring book of laws. It's an incredible book actually declaring really a final word to the people from Moses. 
after God had spoken to them and redeemed them from Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, given them his law, the people then went around wandering in the desert for 40 years. In Deuteronomy is Moses reminding the people of his law and of his commission and of his command before he passes away to prepare them to then march into Canaan, this land that God had promised them. And in Deuteronomy 28, Moses lays out what will happen if the people follow his covenant. Namely, there would be blessings that would come if they followed the voice of the Lord. And what will happen if the people disobey his covenant? Namely, that there will be curses if the people do not follow the voice of the Lord. It's the, and what it says in both of those texts is, if you obey the voice of the Lord, and then it goes on to share the covenant blessings. And then it says, if you disobey the voice of the Lord, it goes on to the various covenant curses. Now the people have disobeyed the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord is now coming to bring those covenant curses upon them due to their disobedience. God had told them what would happen if they didn't obey. They didn't. And now he's speaking to them in light of that disobedience. So what does it say particularly of how he came to do this? In Judges 2 verse 1 says, Now the angel of the Lord... The angel of the Lord comes and appears to them. Now, thus far in Scripture, as we get to the book of Judges, there's only been a couple references to this angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord was the one who spoke to Hagar in the wilderness. The um, angel of the Lord is the one that spoke to Abraham as he was getting ready to offer his son Isaac. And he came in and stopped him and showed him the substitute. That was the voice of the or the angel of the Lord that came in that instance. If you might remember, as Moses talks to God in the burning bush, who was it that he was talking to? It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in that burning bush. And then the only other example we have of it to this point in Scripture is in Numbers 22. There's the miraculous encounter between Balaam and his donkey, all of it which was um, precipitated by the angel of the Lord. Now, throughout the Old Testament going forward from this point, there's numerous references to the angel of the Lord and even numerous examples of the angel of the Lord speaking in the New Testament as well. You may remember that as Joseph um, had this vision and this dream about this um, child who was in this woman he is betrothed to being the Messiah, it was the angel of the Lord that appeared to him in his dream. Now there's many theories as to who this angel of the Lord is. Is this a particular angel like Gabriel that appears in other places in scripture? Is this a revelation of Christ himself to his people? Well, we'll flesh out that concept more as we move through Judges, as this angel of the Lord is going to appear throughout the book. But what I want us to grasp this morning of the angel of the Lord is when the angel of the Lord speaks, it is as God is speaking. This angel of the Lord proclaims the message of God, and it does so in the first person. Notice what the message he gives says. He says, I brought you up out of Egypt. I swore to give your fathers. I will never break my covenant. All right? This is all first person language from God being spoken to the people. The angel of the Lord is directly speaking in the person of God. And thus the people receive this as a direct word from God himself. And they should. Now, where does this angel of the Lord go? It says the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham. Now, Gilgal is near Jericho down by the Jordan. And what this is a picture of is as the people have moved from the Jordan River that they crossed and then went up into Canaan, the promised land, in order to conquer it, to take dominion of it. Now it's a picture of God going up from the Jordan into the land in order to speak to the people, all right? It's a picture of God moving on that same path that the people had just moved on. And Bacham is actually Bethel that we just read about in chapter one, which means the house of God. Now we'll get to it in a little bit as the people are weeping what Bacham means and why they renamed Bethel, the house of God, into Bacham. But it's a picture of God following that same journey they just went on in order to communicate to all the people of the land and that he's going up with them. But this is God speaking. What does he speak? 
As the angel of the Lord comes and speaks to the people and meets them where they are and goes on this journey, what is it that he says? Well, he opens this proclamation by declaring his redemption. Listen to what he opens by reminding the people of as he's speaking to them. He says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I brought you into the land is what he reminds them of. Now this salvation from Egypt was the pinnacle work of God's redemption of this particular people at this point in redemptive history. It was a sign of God freeing the people from their captives, purchasing them unto himself. It was a work purely of his sovereign grace and his strong outstretched arm. How was it that the enemies were destroyed? God led them miraculously into the Red Sea as it was split, and he let the waters crash in on the enemies of God, drowning Pharaoh and his host, and thus saving his people. I think this is partially reminding them of his work of redemption and partially reminding them of the thing that they had forgot in their previous failures as they were so worried about these chariots of iron in chapter one. As God goes and speaks to them, he's like, I'm the one who saved you from those chariots. Do you remember that? I'm the one who saved you from the land of Egypt. He's reminding of the, them of this. And he's also reminding them that he was the one that would save them into Canaan, this land filled with giants and enemies. It was he that was going to purchase this land for them. It was him that was the one who was going to make any of their conquests possible. It was him that had given them any victory that they had had thus far. It was his redeeming work, it was his strong outstretched arm. God's law and now his judgment are coming after his redemption. It's important for us to realize here that he's not saying to these people, you do all these right things and then I'll be in relationship with you. He's speaking to people that he's already purchased unto himself and now they've disobeyed him. We must see God's work of redemption as the foundation to his interactions with us. Although God is about to speak judgment, his judgment are on um, these people is a personal one. It's a judgment on a people whom he has redeemed, which leads to the third aspect of what he speaks, and that is his covenant. Going back down to verse 1, God is saying, I said I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and you shall break down their altars. Right? What is God saying to the people? I have purchased you into relationship with me by my redemption. I have given you my law. And what is it that I have said? Well, first he says that I will never break my covenant with you. And we must realize that in spite of man's faithlessness, in spite of man's fickleness, our God is a covenant-keeping God. Although we fail, our God does not fail. Although we disobey, our God never disobeys that which he has promised. And he's reminding them, I will never break my covenant with you. That's incredible for us to realize as God has given us the promises of the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. These blessings that flow to us from Christ, we must remember that our God is the covenant keeping God. It's not as if he promises to save you by grace through faith, and then later on he'll decide, actually, I changed my mind. Actually, um, I've been looking at how things are going, and I'm going to change course here. No, the God who saved you, the God who promised the covenant blessings to you that flow from Christ, is the covenant-keeping God. He's reminding them of that on the front end. It's a glorious picture here. But we must also see that as God makes that promise and as he is honest in saying he will never break my covenant with you, what did he also tell them as he is making covenants with them? That you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. Well, God had kept his end of the deal, but the people had not kept their end of the deal. 
God said you shall not make any co covenants with the people of the land. And that's exactly what they did over and over again by making a labor agreements with the people rather than driving them out as God had told them to do. Additionally, God had told them to break down all their altars, which we learned that they did not do, but rather they kept for them the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath, these houses of worship in the land, they left standing in order that the pagan practices might continue. So God has made his covenant. The people have not kept up their end of the deal. And we must realize that this does not lead to God breaking his covenant, but it does lead to covenant curses. Okay, so the fact that God is about to judge these people is a sign that he is keeping his covenant. He said in Deuteronomy 28 that if you don't do these things, this is what's going to happen. And you have to realize that if God did not judge the people in this way, he would have been a liar. He said these covenant curses were going to fall upon them if they disobeyed. And because God is an honest God, because he is a covenant-keeping God, because he set these terms of agreement, had he not followed through with these curses, he would not have been a covenant-keeping God, and he would have been a liar. So the fact that they're getting judged here is not any sign of God pulling back from the promises he's made. It's a sign of him carrying out the promises he had made to his people, which leads to his judgment at the end of verse 2 into verse 3. What does he say to them? He says, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. Now listen to what his judgment is. He says, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides. Their gods shall be a snare to you. Well, first we see his findings. As we come before God, the judge of heaven and earth, he is going to weigh all the evidence that is before him. And guess what? He sees all things and knows all things. So there's not going to be ev any evidence that doesn't get admitted into court. He's going to have all of it before his judgment. And as he looks at these things, what does he see as the primary aspect of their disobedience? You have not obeyed my voice. You have not obeyed my voice. Well, what did he say back in Deuteronomy 28 would happen if the people did not obey his voice? That was the exact language used in that covenant arrangement, that the curses would fall upon them. Well, he's saying to them, I've done my findings, I've done my research, you have not obeyed my voice. And saints, how many of us, if we're honest, if when our actions are weighed, what will it be said of us in our many disobediences? You have not obeyed my voice. And he asks them, as God does so often throughout the scriptures, a rhetorical question to get them to self-analyze what it is that he's telling them. It's as when he, God comes to Adam and Eve in the garden and he asks where they are. Is God ignorant to their location? No, he's calling out to them for them to respond. And here, God is asking this question, what is this you have done? God already knows what they've done. He just told them. He said, you have not obeyed my voice. But he's asking them to consider, what is it that you chose? Did you choose something better than what I had for you? How's this going for you? How did you think this was going to turn out, Israel? What did you think was going to be the fruit of this decision? What is this you have done? This is his findings. So what is his verdict? Well, we see in verse 3, he says, Now I say to you, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So th see three aspects of this verdict that's rendered against them. The first is that he says, I will not drive them out. Now compare this um, to the first chapter where we see God says, I've given them into your hand, right? The conquest is yours for the taking. 
Well, now what is he saying in light of their faithlessness and disobedience? He said, I will not drive them out. They are going to remain in the land right alongside you. And it doesn't matter at this point. You can try to build up another defense and try to move in again. That's the reality of the judgment. They will not be driven out, at least not yet. And then he says, they will be as thorns in your sides. And here it's an interesting interpretation of this Hebrew, whether that's the appropriate way to really draw this out in English as saying the thorns in your sides. Really what the Hebrew just says is they will be as in your side is what the Hebrew is saying. And I believe actually this is not a reference to them just being a painful neighbor which is kind of what you can draw out from they'll be thorns in your side. They'll be that annoying neighbor that causes you a lot of problems. I think what he's getting at is something actually far deeper and more personal in this aspect of judgment. They will be as in your side, I believe, is a reference going all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. And who was it that was taken from Adam's side? It was his wife. I think he's saying that you are going to be so commingled with them and united to them. And guess what? You wanted to make covenants with these people? Well, you're going to be in covenant with them, like it or not. What is the primary picture of the first covenant? Is that picture of the union, Adam and Eve, right? Between people. Well, he's saying you want to make covenants with them? They're going to be as your side. They're going to be your rib. You're going to be connected to them, I believe, is what he's trying to draw out for the people. And then the next verse makes a lot of sense in light of that, right? What is it now that you're connected to these people, now that you're not going to be driven out from you? Saying their God shall be a snare to you. And what do we see time and time again as being one of the primary reasons the people stumble into idol worship over and over again in Israel's history? A lot of times it's because they intermarry with the people of the land. They are joined in marriage to these people, and then what happens? They start worshiping the gods of their pagan spouses that they've adopted. We see this time and time again. This verdict is not merely that because of your sins, things will be uncomfortable for you. But there's going to be real consequences for you and your offspring because of your disobedience. This should be a real warning to us, particularly as parents, as grandparents, as we consider these things. We're talking some about the implications of covenant reality this morning as we are considering Abraham. But parents, you must be very clear in your mind, your sins affect your children. Your sins affect your grandchildren. Your disobedience have downstream effects. And one of the greatest lies of Satan is that your sin only affects you. Satan loves to convince you that your sin only has an effect on you. And that's just not true. When we sin, other people are affected. And guess what? It's been that way since Adam and Eve. When they sinned, all of humanity fell. We are still living in the consequences of our forefathers' sins, are we not? That's the doctrine of original sin. And so we should not believe that our sins will have no implication on other people around us. That's certainly not the case. And here the compromise and compromise and compromise of the people, now we see for generations, is going to have implications on them and their offspring and their ultimate worship of the one true and living God as their gods will be a snare to them. They had the opportunity to drive them out. They didn't do it. So how do the people respond in light of this? Well, we see in the last two verses, the people weep. This leads to the why the sermon is titled The House of Weeping. And as we get into their response, I think it's crucial for us to consider The reality that there's two types of tears that can come when people are faced with judgment. One is a person who's filled with regret or shame. In other words, they feel real sorrow over the sin that they committed and thus they cry, right? They are brought to weeping. They're downcast. They're distraught over their own sin before a holy God. It's this regret and shame that comes from someone who really understands the sin that they've committed against a holy God and how that affects other people. But then there's another kind of tears that can come in light of judgment. 
And that is one who is distressed over the consequences of their actions. You might have seen this with your children before, maybe in moments of discipline, where they're really distraught, not because they feel bad for what they've done, but because they are regretting the consequences that are about to come upon them, right? I don't feel bad that I did this sin. I feel bad that I'm about to get punished for it. And I think it's worth asking as we get into this section, what kind of tears are these people really crying? Are they crying genuine, repentant tears? Or are they crying the tears of a people who just had a bunch of curses put on them and they're a little bummed out about it? What is their response? Well, we see the initial response in verse 4. It says, As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voice and wept. The people lifted up their voice and wept. There's a few things we can see about this initial response in verse 4, is that their lament was communal. It wasn't merely a personal thing, but all the people heard this and all the people wept. They understand that these sins that were committed, these consequences that would come certainly, was something that affected the whole body. Just as the angel of the Lord went and visited all the people, now all the people are brought to weeping. And we also see that their lament was vocal. They lifted up their voices. Can you imagine a whole country and nation weeping at the same time? What a terrifying thing to be a fly on the wall to observe. This was something that was very vocal. And now part of this is just kind of cultural expression. You know, it's common in different cultures to be more expressive about these sorts of things, even in public setting. But it, there was a show that was being done of this weeping. Every single person, it says, throughout the land was doing it. There's this whole communal, vocal weeping. And we see getting into verse 5 that it wasn't just this outward expression, but actually that they desired to make an incredible consecration of their tears. To consecrate means um, to declare something to be symbolic or to set something apart. And in the church, we consecrate a number of things, right? If you think of the Lord's Supper, are we enjoying just merely just some random bread and some random juice, right? No, we're saying this is a consecrated meal. It means more than the elements that are just in front of us, right? As Christians, we are called to live consecrated lives, right? Set apart, distinct lives. We're not like any other people. We are God's people set apart for his kingdom and for his glory. And here we see the people sense the need to consecrate their city, to set it apart, to define it according to their sorrow. Listen to what it says in verse 5. It says, and they called the name of the place Bacham. And that word Bacham literally means weepers. They called the name of their city Bacham, which means weepers. Now, it's worth us remembering here what city is this that they just renamed into weeping or Bacham. But it was the city of Bethel. Now, Bethel literally means the house of God. So what's the symbolic nature of this consecration of changing the name here? That the house of God has turned into the house of weeping. What used to be the place of God's pleasure and participation and union now is the place of God's judgment. And thus the people are brought from worship into weeping, from those at union with God to those who have offended him. Sin has turned the house of God into a house of weeping. And what should have been a place of conquest has now been a place of consecrated defeat. As we looked at last week of the various compromises and compromises, really the only section of that that is arguable if they did right was at Bethel. They, they, they made a minor mistake there, but overall they did what they were supposed to do in Bethel. And then just a few verses later, that one place, the house of God, Bethel, becomes Bacham, the house of weeping. It's the reality of what their sin has done to the people. But was this a sign of godly repentance and response of the people in light of God speaking? And I think not in that. 
I think these are people who are going through outward motions, but have not genuinely repented before the Lord. Let us consider in the final aspect of their response, their vain sacrifice. How does this section end? It says, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So in light of this city being consecrated by their tears, being changed from Bethel to Bacham, they then offer up a sacrifice to the Lord. But it's worth us asking, was this genuine? We are called, and we should consider this verse in light of the book of Judges, to judge a tree by its fruit. What was the fruit of these tears? What was the fruit of this sacrifice? And it's worth us looking as we go through their response in verse 4 and 5, what is not pictured in this account. The first thing that is not pictured in this account is any confession. Do they own up to any of their sin in any of this? No. There's not an ounce in verse 4 or 5 of any of them coming forward, admitting to any of their compromises or defeats or sins against God. All we have is tears, but there is not confession. Is there any sign of repentance? Are there any picture them from this point turning from their sin? Well, no, that's not seen at all. In fact, if you look forward in the narrative, if you go from here, flip over to chapter 6, verse 7, because remember, that next part is introduction number two. Chapter three, verse seven, is where the narrative picks up and says, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Okay? That's the next place the narrative picks up from there. Because the second introduction in large part is a summary of the whole book of Judges. So as the narrative continues, we see they're not serving God. They're serving the false gods. So should we believe here that this was genuine repentance and confession before the Lord? It doesn't seem that way. Additionally, what we don't see here is God's work of restoration. As God's people come before him, our God is a holy God who is faithful and just to forgive his people of unrighteousness. And throughout the book of Judges, we see time and time again, when the people genuinely turn to the Lord, he does give them peace. He does restore them in some sense. It's not usually long-term and lasting. But as God's people return to him, he does pour blessings back on them. He is a gracious and merciful God. But here we see they respond in this way, and there's no restoration that's given, which seems like there was not any genuine confession or repentance that is offered. But what is pictured in this text? There's sorrow over the consequences of God's judgment. They are sad and they are weeping, but it's just because of the verdict they received. One of the things for us to realize here, you may be not completely tracking with me and going, but Ryan, don't you know they were weeping? Don't you know they were sad? What is hell described as? The place with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is not Bethel, it's Bacham. It's not the house of God. It's the house of tears. It's the house of weeping. So weeping is not a sign of confession or repentance. The people in hell are weeping. It's not a sign that they've turned to the Lord. Here is an attempt to appease the consequences through faithless works. Well, God's upset with us. Why don't we offer a sacrifice? God has punished us. Let, let's give him a sacrifice. Maybe that'll put us back in his good graces. But is that the type of sacrifice the Lord desires? A great picture of genuine godly repentance in the scriptures is pictured for us in Psalm 51 as David is found out in his sin. And in Psalm 51, we see over and over that he offers genuine confession, not just for hurting other people, but particularly against God, against you and you alone have I sinned, is the cry of David. David cries out to God and asks for his mercy. He cries out to God asking that God would purify him to blot out his sins, to give him a clean heart. He pleads that God would not remove his presence from him. He declares that he will turn from his sin and teach others to do the same. 
And then listen to how Psalm 51 ends. This is part of the verse that's on the front of your bulletin this morning. It says uh, to God as he's speaking to him after coming before him with all these things, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. What's he saying? In light of the need of repentance, God doesn't just want some arbitrary sacrifice. That's not what he's looking for. He said, you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. But then what does he say? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Do you see the picture here? God wants genuine repentance, not merely going through the motions. A hard-hearted sacrifice is worthless to God. But after genuine repentance has been wrought, what does he say? Well, Psalm 51 ends by saying, Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. The bull will be offered on your altar. Is the point of Psalm 51 that we just should be done with sacrifices? God doesn't care about them. No, the point that David's making is if they're not genuine and if they're not in faith and if they're not from a heart of repentance, that they are worthless to God. But when they are given how God requires of them, they are pleasing to him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Does Jesus just want us to go through external motions? No, but if we love him, we will do what he says. And what he regularly tells people is to go and sin no more, right? Those who have been redeemed by him are then called to turn from that sin and live differently. Do we see any of that in these people? In 3.7, we see that there's none of that. There's no fruit of repentance as these people go on to live. They went through the motions. They consecrated their city with a really depressing name. And they offered up a sacrifice, and then they went on to worship the false gods. It was not genuine repentance. So what are four takeaways for us in conclusion as we consider God's word this morning? The first is that this is a judgment on covenant members. This is not a judgment against God's enemies, the Canaanites, that sort of thing. God here is rendering a judgment on his own people. And we know from the book of Hebrews that it tells us that the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father in the son in whom he delights. And so, saints, you must realize that even in Christ, even as you've been redeemed by him, even as you've been washed by the blood, when you rebel against him, it won't go well for you. Our actions in this life do matter. If you love him, then keep his commandments. God does care how we live. This should cause in us a righteous fear. When you sin against God, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to send you to hell if you are in Christ. But you shouldn't think it's going to go well for you either. God does judge our sin. He judges the sin of his own people, his own covenant members. We see him do that here. This should cause us fear, but also should cause us comfort. When we feel the Lord's discipline in life, it's because he does love us. It's painful, but it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those of us who are trained by it. When you have consequences in this life for your sin, praise God for those consequences. Lean into them. Don't just try to run away from them. If you're experiencing pain because of your sin, thank God for it. Allow it to teach you so it can conform you more and more to the image of Christ. So first takeaway, this is a judgment on covenant members. The second takeaway for us from this text is the Lord is faithful even when we fail. Is this the end of the story for the people of Israel, even though they're hard-hearted and disobedient? No, it's not even close to the end of the story. God does bring his curses upon them, and they do suffer the judgments that come in light of their sin. But God is not done with these people. And if you sin against him, I encourage you, turn back to the Lord. He is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Be quick to repent and then march back in the direction God has for you. Our Lord is faithful even when we fail. And it's while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Christ. You come to him dirty that he might make you clean. March forward. We have a faithful God. 
The third takeaway for us is there is a difference between sorrow and repentance. If you're just bummed out when you sin, that doesn't necessarily mean that you repented. Repentant means agreeing with God about your sin, first off, that you see it as heinous as God sees it, but then it means that you actually turn from that sin. If you make zero effort to stop sinning, you have not repented, no matter what outward show you put on. You can cry all you want. You can rename your house. Doesn't mean that you genuinely repented. And we see this often, unfortunately, in people's lives. Sometimes in a, a stir of emotion, people will be brought to tears and, and so sorry. But then as a little time goes on, we see that there's no genuine fruit of change. Jesus warns us of this in the parable of the soils or sower, depending on how that's titled. That some initially respond, but it's shown later that it wasn't ever from the heart. So take worry about this. Take consideration about this in your own life. Take this into account. Am I genuinely repenting or am I just sorry I got caught? They're not the same thing. The fourth takeaway is that this was all unnecessary. This was all unnecessary. Now, one of the great things in this life and from the scriptures is you don't have to learn every lesson the hard way. Did you know that? We're good at learning lessons the hard way. That's my primary form of learning, unfortunately. But that is not the way we need to learn. Things were going really well for them when they were following what God said. And then things went really poorly for them when they stopped following what God said. We can learn from that. What's the takeaway from this? This is a, you know, a very sophisticated point a preacher will make. Do what God says. It will go better for you. We don't have to go through this the hard way. These things didn't have to happen. So my final concluding question for you to consider is, saints, where do you want to dwell? Do you want to dwell in Bethel or Bacham? Do you want to dwell in Bethel or Bacham? God has given you the path of righteousness. Are you going to walk in it? Or would you rather walk in his judgment? Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as a people who have sinned against you greatly. But we come before you who's a gracious covenant-keeping God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, if we brought sins into this house this morning, let's not bring them out of this house. Lord, if we brought sins into this house this morning, let us not bring them out of this house. Let us repent and turn from those sins. Lord, do not allow us to be hard-hearted in rebellion. But soften us, Lord. Lead us in genuine repentance. And God, I pray for us as a people that we would see full of faith the blessings that you have for your people when they would follow your command. You've given us a good word. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. Would we live like that's true? Lord, would we enjoy the fruit of following in your path? And that doesn't mean it'll always be easy, but it will always be better to follow what you have for us. You have good gifts to give to your children. And often we don't live like that's true. Lord, would you help us live like that's true? Would you help us to turn from our sin and enjoy your dwelling Lord, just as that was a city of Bethel, the house of God, we now know through the gospel that we have your Holy Spirit living with us always. So Lord, would we live as if we're living with God? Would we not live in rebellion to you? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.